everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to Chatham House. Um, welcome back to those of you who are regulars. Um, just before I get going, um, some just some housekeeping points. This event is um, on the record uh, and it's being live streamed. So welcome as well to those who are watching uh, online. Um, please um, put your phones on silent. Um, and because it's on the record, you can tweet. We encourage you to tweet using the hashtag CHEvents or CHDemTech, which is the hashtag for the project on democracy and technology in Europe, uh, which, as some of you know, I've been leading. Um, we've been having lots of discussions around the sort of technology part of that. Um, we've, been, we've had discussions on um, digital parties and on social media and so on. Today we're going to focus on a different aspect of democracy in Europe, and that's the specific question of whether EU fits into the, the picture, as it were, of, of, of democracy in Europe. Um, I should explain the slight change in our speakers. Um, some of you would have been expecting Sarah Ludford. Um, she unfortunately had a death in her family last night. Um, and Gisela Stewart very kindly, at extremely short notice, agreed to step in. I just emailed her literally an hour or two ago um, and, uh, and couldn't think of a better re replacement. Um, so thank you very much, um, Gisela, for, for joining us. Um, Gisela, I think, needs um, no introduction at all um, for this audience. Um, she's the chair of Change Britain, which is the um, successor organisation to the official Leave campaign in the 2016 referendum. Um, she was a Labour MP from 1997 to 2017 and a minister in the Blair government, and she's the chair of Wilton Park. Um, Andreas Roeder, to my left, um, is a a uh, prolific and wide-ranging um, historian at the University of Mainz, um, also a very influential figure in the Christian Democrats. Um, he and I go back a long way, and in particular, um, we both took part, or well, actually Andreas organized a conference five or six years ago um, in Berlin, which was extremely eye-opening for me about German Euroscepticism and some of the similarities and differences between that and British um, Euroscepticism. Um, at some point, we may get into that. Mm. Um, he's also written very interestingly, we've had an ongoing conversation, actually, about German power in Europe. Uh, and your most recent book is about conservatism, is a sort of new manifesto, as it were, for, <coughs> for conservatism. Um, so um, the essay question we've, um, we've put is, um, how democratic um, is the EU? Um, obviously, this is a very live issue in this country in the context of, of Brexit. Um, it seems to me that the Leave side of the argument, uh, this has been one of the central arguments uh, for, on the Leave side, that the EU is uh, undemocratic, anti-democratic. The Remain side, it seems to me, has had less to say about this issue and has tended to focus on some of the other benefits of EU membership, um, like above all the economic uh, benefits. Um, but, um, but perhaps um, we can start with, um, with you, um, Andreas. Um, what is the right way to think about the relationship between the EU and democracy? Is the EU d democratic? Is it undemocratic? Is it non-democratic, as Peter Mayer, the Irish political scientist, put it? What's the right way to think about the relationship between the EU itself and democracy? I would say the EU is no, at least no parliamentary uh, democracy. And at the same time, I want to say it does not have a democratic deficit. And I would like to explain this, if it, even if it seems like a contradiction to you. So the question is, why is the EU not a democracy? Why is it not a parliamentary democracy? And I think there are at least four reasons for that. The first reason is that it consists of two threads of legitimation. Uh, the one is the intergovernmental threat, um, going from the electorate via the elected governments, um, uh, of the member states to the European co Council. This is the one threat. Uh, and the other threat of legitimation is uh, the supranational level, uh, which means this legitimation go goes from the electorate to the European Parliament uh, to uh, the Parliament. So this is a very specific construction, these two threats of legitimation. Um, and having said that, this leads us to the second reason. Uh, this parliament, uh, which um, forms the second thread of legitimation, uh, is not the sovereign of the government. And I think this is pretty crucial since that the parliament decides um, about the government. 
is essential for a parliamentary system. So what we saw was that the European Parliament tried to take over this crucial right of a parliament in a parliamentary system to decide on the government uh, by the system of the so-called Spitzenkandidaten, which you all know uh, remained a very German word in um, the European uh, integration history. So what the parliament tried to do was to transform the European Union, the whole construction, into a more parliamentary system by assuming the right to designate the government uh, by the parliament. In a certain way, this worked in 2014. It was a coup uh, which was fabricated by Jean-Claude Juncker uh, and Martin Schulz. But as we saw, it did not work in 2019. And this uh, was really crucial since uh, the proof of this uh, constitutional innovation of assuming rights for the European Parliament would have been uh, the repeating of this procedure in 2019. It did not happen, so, uh, but uh, the European Council took back uh, the right to designate the head of the Commission. So this was a kind of rollback of power uh, to the European Council. And there is another argument. Even if the European Parliament had succeeded, it would have won um, the right to decide not about the European government, since the European Commission is not um, similar to a government in a parliamentary system, but the European Commission is what is called the keeper of the treaties, and sometimes it might be the mover of integration. But first of all, it is competing with the European Council, and ex experience teaches in times of crisis, its influence is pushed back by the Council, as we, for example, saw uh, in the Euro debt crisis. So you can say that the European Council still is the master of the state of emergency, and as a German, this is quoting Karl Schmidt, uh, and being the master of the state uh, of emergency is uh, the famous definition of uh, um, the sovereign. So, what we are having is a very, very complicated construction in terms of legitimation and in terms of functioning, which is perfect fodder for constitutional lawyers, which means particularly for German constitutional lawyers. And I think this was uh, one of the most interesting uh, experiences for you to realize what German constitutional experts are thinking and talking about. Um, and I leave it up to you whether uh, you prefer the German constitutional court's uh, word of the so-called Staatenverbund, I will get back to that, uh, or whether you um, prefer the traditional uh, wording of Samuel, Samuel Pufendorf, uh, his saying about the old Holy Roman Empire, uh, which he uh, characterized as an irregular body looking like a monster. Uh, in a certain way, this is still true uh, for the European Union. Um, the third non-democratic peculiarity of the EU, I would say, is uh, the elective franchise for the European Parliament. Um, and the problem is not only, or the, no, not, not the problem, but the point is not that there are different national franchises, but, but um, the, uh, the specific is the principle of the so-called degressive proportionality, um, which means that due to the different size of member states, a member of the European Parliament for Malta represents some 70,000 inhabitants, while a member of European Parliament from, from Germany represents 830,000 inhabitants, which is a, um, a difference by a factor of 12. So some say, okay, uh, not a problem. This is the same principle as we have it uh, in the uh, Senate of the US. This is due to the um, principle of the representation of states. Yes, and this indeed is true for chambers of states, and it's true for the European Council, it's uh, uh, true for the Council of the ECB, uh, for the European uh, uh, Court. Um, it's also true for the German Bundesrat uh, and for the US Senate. But this, the chamber of state, is not the standard of comparison uh, for the first chamber or the chamber of representatives. Um, the chambers of elected representatives uh, do not follow the principle of the representation of states, but the principle of the representation of people, and the principle is one man or one woman, uh, one vote, which means that one 
vote should weigh as much as another. Um, and this so it's true for the House of, uh, this is true for the House of Representatives in the US, it's true for the German Bundestag, um, and it's true for, for uh, the UK. And so far, uh, all these uh, political systems do have even constituencies. Um, one um, representative in the House of Representatives represents um, some 700,000 uh, uh, inhabitants in the US, um, uh, um, a member of the German parliament uh, represents some 250,000 inhabitants uh, and the same is true for UK that you uh, always try to have equal uh, constituencies. Um, so this means that for uh, the <coughs> European parliament this crucial um, principle of representation of the people does not work due to the um, principle of degressive uh, proportionality. So this is the third reason, and uh, very briefly, a fourth one uh, is um, what still is missing, even if things have changed a bit, that there is no democratic public uh, within Europe. However, uh, exceeding the question of democratic institutions, the question of, uh, um, uh, of, an, of a democratic public uh, is substantial uh, and is crucial uh, for a democracy, and this is one of the other um, major requirements of a democracy uh, the European Union is lacking. So, these are four reasons why the EU is not a parliamentary democracy. And now the question is, why do I say this is not a democratic deficit? To turn it the other way around, it would be a democratic deficit if the EU were a full-fledged uh, sovereign state uh, aspiring to be a democracy, but it isn't. So the European Union still is, now I come back what the Bundesverfassungsgericht uh, has judged in its major uh, judgments about the Maastricht Treaty and the Lisbon Treaty in 1993 and uh, 2009. So uh, the German uh, Constitutional Court characterized uh, the European Union as a Staatenverbund which is a word which must originate from German constitutional lawyers. Um, however, it means that the European Union is a unique institution between the Federation of States and the Federal States, being neither of them. So, and for a Staatenverbund, to use the German word, where the sovereignty in the end is still with the national constitutive peoples. So this is not a problem. Um, since it is not a full-fledged uh, democracy. I would like to draw one conclusion, but to make one very brief point uh, in advance. I would say there is another point I would like to highlight uh, in the, um, uh, in the um, uh, relationship between the EU uh, and uh, democracy. So, as I said, EU in itself is not a democracy, but uh, the member states are required to, meet, to be democracy. And as I would say, this is the real success story of the European Union, particularly after 1989. So what we are always discussing are problems with minority rights uh, in Poland or in Hungary, or with the rule of law in Poland and in Hungary. We are discussing the question of corruption in Bulgaria and Romania. However, if you choose another standard of comparison, if you look to other post-communist states, if you have a look to Ukraine, if you have a look to what happened uh, in former Yugoslavia in the 90s, or if you look what happened uh, in East Central Europe after 1918, after the breaking down of, uh, of the empires in East Central Europe, I would say if you compare it to that, there is much more democracy within the European Union than without it. And the problem is we have an epistemic problem. We don't realize avoided catastrophes as avoided catastrophes. And I think this contribution to stabilize whatever has been reached in East Central Europe after 1989, whatever has been avoided uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, shatter zones, as Robert Gerbert uh, told the uh, East Central European states after 1918, uh, whatever has been avoided uh, is a really uh, a, a historical success. So again, to come to an end, um, there is no democratic deficit if the EU sticks to what it's called to be a Staatenverbund uh, and if it does not aspire to become a sovereign state. Uh, and the conclusion I would draw out of this as from a German perspective 
uh, is that uh, I would recommend to replace the idea of an ever closer union by the idea and the concept of a flexible union, by a flexible European Union which is ready for deepening the integration where it is useful, and at the same time ready for reducing it where it has proved to be necessary. Um, a European Union which focuses its core tasks, such as single market and trade, European mobility, which I think is one of the major uh, um, uh, tasks uh, uh, Europe, the European Union can foster, uh, or digitalization uh, or uh, some other questions. And if this European Union, um, uh, European Union which realizes that its specific institutional sa shape marks no democratic deficits, but can be a source of strength if it really combines the added value of supranationality with the persistent strengths of the nations and their cooperation. This would be slightly different from the narrative of the ever closer <coughs> union, but at the same time I think this could be a, a real, really productive perspective for the European Union, am I saying as a German. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Andreas. And, and actually, it's <coughs> interesting how you ended there, because in some ways, it's, um, a lot of this is very familiar, I think, for a British audience, you know, particularly the, the point you made about you know, abandoning the idea of a closer union. This is clearly one of the things that David Cameron tried to renegotiate. Um, and I think I'm right in saying that um, you know, in Berlin, or in Germany in general, if you say a lot of these things, you would be seen as somewhat on the Eurosceptic end of the argument. Um, certainly compared to a lot, of, a lot of other people in Germany. But I wonder if I can just, just to push you on two points, just to, cl to clarify. So, um, mm -hmm. so first of all, um, in terms of the kind of institutional reform that's needed, I mean, you talked a little bit at the end there about some policy areas, um, you know, that yeah. might be sort of repatriated or, or, or moved back to the national level from the EU level. But in terms of institutional reform, um, unless I missed something, um, as I understood it, all that you think needs to happen, I mean, basically the EU is kind of okay as it is. What needs to happen is this question of um, regressive disproportionality. In other words, um, I, I mean, one consequence of, of fixing that would be that member states like Germany would have an even greater weight. Um, but apart from that, are there institutional reforms that you think are necessary in the EU? Uh, I would not recommend uh, to change the franchise for the European Parliament. I think uh, you can leave it as it is, uh, since it's uh, specific of the European Parliament oh, and I the see. European Union. Uh, however, what I say, this is not, at the same this time, this means it's not a parliamentary democracy. And I think if we just accept yes. that uh, EU is no parliamentary yes. democracy, okay. Uh, this, I think, would be an advantage to, 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 to take it and to accept it as it is when it does not aspire to yes. become a federal European state which would not be a parliamentary democracy. So in other words, then there are no institutional reforms that are necessary from uh, your point I of view. I think the question, uh, the, the, the number of 27 or 28 commissioners uh, is okay. a problem. So but I think there could be institutional reforms, but I don't think that the question of institutional reforms uh, should be predominant. I think right. uh, the, 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 um, the prudent self-restriction of the European Union on those questions and policy areas where it really creates an added value. I think uh, this would be uh, the perspective for the European Union. And, and that sort of brings me to the second point. So, so uh, all of this rests though on um, the EU not going further in integration. Um, and, and this is where it seems to me you do differ from not just people in Germany, but, but pro-Europeans elsewhere on, on the continent. You're suggesting, as I understand it, that even in the Eurozone, I mean, in, in the UK, for example, lots of people would say, you know, we don't want to be part of this further integration, but clearly the, the Eurozone needs to integrate further. You're saying, as I understand it, that there can be no further integration. No, no. I, uh, um, I don't say. I don't mean that. Uh, what I would mean by a flexible union is a European Union which is ready to deepen integration where it's necessary. So, for example, uh, defence politics, uh, um, migration politics, uh, migration politics should be uh, crucial for uh, the European Union. And I think uh, this, uh, the, the, the defense uh, initiative, this is new um, uh, defense in the initiatives uh, which uh, is based on voluntary contributions, I think is really is the right way uh, for Europe uh, to deal. So what I think, um, is it a kind of deepening of integration? 
uh, if uh, Europe does much more in order to, uh, to create um, infrastructure in terms of mobility. So I, I, I went to Tallinn uh, a couple of weeks ago, and what, what, what the Estonians are wishing is a, a direct railway connection from t Tallinn to Berlin. This, I think, this, for example, is Europe at its very best. So, uh, as a, so I would say, um, if this European Union would be flexible in order to deepen integration where it's necessary, but also ready to reduce it where it doesn't work, which might include the euro. However, I wouldn't do anything uh, on the euro at the moment. Uh, yes. um, so I think um, the, the problem is that uh, Europe has embarked on this one way of the ever closer yes. union. And yes. this was the, the, yes. the idea that it's um, uh, the idea of that it's, it just can be a one way. And it reminds me on Erich Honecker, who had the idea that uh, vorwärts immer, rückwärts, im, uh, rückwärts nimmer, uh, always, how do you say that in English? Uh, Always forwards, never backwards, I yeah, guess. Yeah, something. So, and, and I think this has been the wrong way. But, but uh, sorry, I do want to bring in Gisela, yeah. but, but just to push you further on this, on this point about integration. Um, as I understand it, what you're calling integration is just cooperation between EU member states. You're, because, you know, what I had in mind when yeah. I said it further integration yeah. is the transfer of power. So, for example, yeah. in defense, if you were to go further in terms of actually transferring powers on security, yeah. then surely the EU does start to take on the characteristics of a normal nation state. Um, yeah, so uh, the question is, uh, the, it, depends on the, uh, it depends on the policy area. Yes. Uh, so I would, if it is necessary, for example, trade politics, uh, I think uh, is, is uh, um, the EU is a much stronger uh, trade power than, than the nation states are. So that, uh, I think this is one of the success stories, apart from um, uh, the um, uh, trade agreement with the US. Uh, but, but with Japan, for example, I think it has, be has become a, a success story. So this, um, in, in trade politics, we have this transfer of sovereignty. Uh, I would be open to a transfer sovereignty in question of migration, if it works. But I, what I would, uh, and uh, on the other hand, I would prefer cooperation, but a, a flexible union um, could decide which would be better and wouldn't be uh, pre-decided for the one transfer of sovereignty uh, in the one and only direction. Great. Um, Gisela, as I said, some, some of this, I think, is quite close to a British view from, uh, compared to a lot of the way that a lot of Germans think about the EU. But how do you see this as somebody who's born in Germany but obviously is based here? Yeah, um, uh, when Hans sent me an email, I actually genuinely was sitting, uh, reading a paper which had just appeared, and it was, I got you off the internet, because I thought it was interesting, it's called Looking Like a State, the Seduction of Isomorphic Mimicry, where in mimicry you conflate looks like and substitute for does, and they say this is the technique for justifying failure. And that's, that is what's bedeviling us in this whole debate. And particularly when it comes to the Brits and the Germans. It's, I, I feel I've spent the last 20 years talking to either side, saying this is why you will never understand each other. Because when you use the same word, you just mean something completely different with it. Uh, so, and you know, the, it's, uh, it is said that all politicians' careers end in failure. Uh, I don't think that is entirely true. But I think all politicians end up being defined by subject areas which they hadn't originally chosen. Uh, and they somehow can't get away from them. And I have to say that when I entered Parliament in 1997 in Neville Chamberlain's old constituency as a German, born in Munich, uh, the Europe was not the subject I wished to get involved in. Uh, and yet I seem to be singularly incapable of shaking it off. Um, so in 2001, I was sent off to Brussels to spend 15 months in the very charming uh, company of Shizgardista and a uh, then fairly obscure French commissioner called Michel Barnier. I don't think anybody's heard of the man in, in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were charged with um, uh, drafting a European constitution which would bring Europe closer to the people. Um, and literally all the things we're saying today, I've heard for the last 15 years. Uh, T tell me one subject which you would stop doing. I remember in 2001, there was this question of the European Union needs to stop doing things. So I said to the commission, have you ever rejected uh, a, 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 a proposal on the basis that it was not the, was not the, the member states should do, do that? And they said, 
Well, actually, the only one we can think of was the Animal Sue Directive, which was a British proposal under the British presidency to have European standards for <coughs> the temperature in, 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 in zoos for uh, maritime animals. So the talk of doing less in some areas is always there, but it never happens. So in this despair of not being able to give up the subject, I've sort of really gone back to very, very basics as to even what do I mean by democracy? And in that concept, I asked myself, and David Cameron called the, the referendum, because you have to remember, as a Bavarian, Bavaria is a federal state, Germany is a federal state, I don't regard the F word uh, as, as, as offensive. I was brought up to think that federal structures uh, stopped the center accumulating power. Uh, so, so even when they talk about federal yeah. in the British context, I go and say, but when the Germans talk federal, that means something completely different from when you say federal. So uh, I thought in 2016, when David Cameron uh, called the referendum, I thought, what would he have had to come back with for me to vote remain? And actually, it wasn't an impossible char uh, chart sheet in that sense, because if he had come back with a deal which said there will forever and ever be countries who are members of the euro, the single currency, and those who are not, and this is not a question of a few countries having an opt-out, it is a Europe that actually is not of two speeds, because two speeds still imply the same destination, but it is a variable configuration. I would have said at that moment, you know what, let's give this a try, because the elephant in the room is the single currency. The, and this is requires some changes. So let's go back to the democracy bit. There's a, there's a, when, whenever I want to get myself out of the Anglo-Saxon Germanic sphere, I turn to uh, a Bulgarian called Ivan Krastev. Mm -hmm. And Ivan, he, he runs a, a think tank in, in Sofia uh, called Red House, and he's just written this, this, this book called After Europe. And he makes this very interesting observation that, you know, because I used to say to him, my, my basic definition of democracy is that I can vote in those who are in charge, and what's more to the point, I can vote them out again. And he said to me at one stage, he said, yeah, but what's the point of being able to vote your government if you're in Greece and they can't determine policy? So I have refined my definition of democracy to say, not only do I want to be able to, to vote in my government, but by voting in my government, I do wish to have a say about the policies and change them as required when they pursue it. Which takes me to where I think the, the democratic deficit goes on. <coughs> um, and within the European Union, you, you cannot deny that the whole trajectory has always been towards that kind of deeper integration which takes you to the state. Because, you know, I have no problem with your, your Staatenverbund, but the euro requires more than a Staatenverbund. You cannot avoid this. And then there's lots of talk which never happens. 2002, I remember sitting in Brussels arguing about whether we should have a rapid reaction force, because the question of defense was always there. 50,000, small call, you know. 15 years on, we still haven't got enough soldiers capable to call on to have a rapid reaction force. And we've still got hardly any countries which are reaching the, 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 the NATO target. And even we who reach the NATO target do it by some rather creative way of, of including the pensions and things. So the democratic deficit comes in where, because in, in the European constitution, which I sort of thought, yeah, let's give this a try. I thought, what are the things which I would require to make this work? So my cross on the ballot box has to mean something when I elect the parliament. I have not, I, sorry, I refine this. The only European election I have lived through where the European election was fought on the subject of Europe was actually bizarrely the last one where the United Kingdom returned as the majority party representing it, the Brexit party. The previous European election the biggest parliamentary representation in the European Parliament was UKIP. But that has completely passed by the, the, the kind of uh, thing. So if, if I vote for the European Socialists, I do require to have some sense of what the European Socialists will stand for in the European Parliament. So, so I, you know, when the idea of the Spitzenkandidat came up, uh, I, in 2002, one of the things which, which we talked about, 
was that at least at least have on the ballot paper who your party would send a, as a commissioner. So you know when the, when when the Labour Party has its closed list, they would say, and if we get more MEPs than any other party, we would ask the government X to be the commissioner. Sort of some introductions. So m m my difficulty is that if we go down a trajectory of losing the people. And by the way, if I even go further back to democracy, and we have this, this, this debate now in the United Kingdom, we, have, you know, we, we are going through what in 200 years ago would have been a civil war in terms of the massive tensions of powers and redefinitions of <coughs> power. It's either a balance of power, but you need to decide where your, your core authority comes from. Up to the 19th century, it was either king or God. The American Revolution and the French Revolution required neither king nor God, so, so we rediscovered the people. And when we rediscover the people, we have to have mechanisms to control what otherwise would be mob rule. That's why we've got political parties, we've got elections, we've got judges which sort of contain. They, this is a very sophisticated structure. But just as like the United Kingdom at the moment, I say we're beginning to discover that when we create something which we call a constitutional court, we should not be 10 years on be outraged when it starts to behave like a constitutional court. But that then has knock-on consequences. And I think in the European Union, there's equally been a kind of denial that when things aren't what you precisely define them and what they mean, that has consequences. So looking at the European Union, my idea of the democratic one, the dangers I think it's facing is that the Euro countries will have to become more than Staatsverband. They have to be. That requires the parties. And for those who are not, and I finish on that one, the, the danger I fear is that if you've got countries on the periphery who elect the government but don't feel they're shaping policy, or they feel they can elect the government, which is probably more extreme than they would normally elect because they hope that the European Commission reigns them in and stops them, e.g. some things which have developed in Poland, you will end up with an electorate that regards its entire power to be no more than to know what it objects to. And to me, democ democracy has to have the ability to object, but it must be by far more constructive. Great, thank you, Gisela. I want to bring in the audience, but Andres, do you want to briefly respond to this point on the euro? And I suppose there yeah. are two aspects to it. Yeah, One yeah. is this point about whether um, you know, the status quo is unsustainable, so further integration um, is needed. But then secondly, also this point about the sort of democratic implications, because so I, I often like to mention this Wolfgang Schäuble quote where he says, um, um, we cannot allow elections to influence economic, to change economic policy in the context of the Eurozone. Um, and is there not a way in which, um, particularly in the Eurozone, but perhaps more broadly in the EU, this um, replacement um, <coughs> uh, of, um, or, or rather taking areas of policy out of the space of, politi uh, of political contestation, democratic contestation, creating rules to govern them, is this not itself inherently anti-democratic, and that's been sort of exposed in the Euro crisis, hasn't it? Um, let me start with uh, saying a word about the construction of the European Monetary Union. And the question is uh, whether it is a misconstruction or it is not, but uh, it is one of those peculiar European constructions since uh, it's resting on two pillars. On the one hand, uh, the currency politics um, uh, has, um, um, how do you say for Gemeinschaftet? Um, mutualized. Mu mutualized. Uh, yeah, Whether the fiscal politics uh, remain in the uh, in the responsive uh, in the response uh, uh, of uh, of the of, of the uh, single states. Uh, so fiscal politics uh, and currency politics are divided, uh, and fiscal politics uh, do underlie a system of rules of the so so-called stability criteria, uh, and. Uh, all the member states of the European Union have agreed um, uh, to obey these um, uh, uh, criteria of stability. So this is at least the German interpretation uh, of the construction of the monetary union. Yeah. Um, so uh, you have this supranational pillar with the ECB and the currency politics uh, and the national pillar uh, with national responsibility for fiscal politics. Um, now the question is, whether this is a sustainable construction. Uh, and I know that there are uh, quite a, cup, a couple of uh, economic experts, you repeated it and said, this is not a sustainable construction, this cannot work. I know that uh, uh, economists do say so. Uh, 
Um, at least the, 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 the German interpretation, and I think the German interpretation does fit to the, at least to the text of the treaty. I, I think it's not a wrong interpretation. Uh, say, okay, um, uh, this is the construction we agreed upon, and again, to quote the Constitutional Court, uh, if the European Monetary Union would uh, substantially deviate from this construction, uh, it uh, would pose the question whether the European Monetary Union would still be legi le legitimate in Germany. Um, so the Constitutional Court said if the Monetary Union would be changed substantially, uh, um, um, uh, heading to a, a transfer union or something like that, uh, to mutualization of uh, fiscal politics, uh, this would require a German referendum. Yes. And do I have to say anything about referendum here? Um, uh, so um, this is the German position. And uh, to, 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 say, to say it again, I, I see the uh, uh, objections of economic experts. And at the same time, uh, I see uh, the German argument of the uh, institutional construction of uh, uh, the monetary union. Um, and, and, uh, and, at the same time, and at the same time, I would say, if states have uh, agreed to obey certain rules uh, and they uh, have become part of an institution um, uh, working with sanctions, uh, um, in a certain way this is a voluntary uh, contribution uh, or membership of this uh, monetary union. Um, so that at the moment, uh, uh, Greece, uh, which is the example, um, was not able uh, to pay its loans uh, and uh, was require, uh, requiring uh, the help for the, for, uh, from the monetary union. And you know the German argument is uh, uh, article, article 125 of the uh, Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union excludes, um, uh, um, excludes that... Uh, bailouts, sorry, basically. Uh, excludes bailouts, yeah. Um, and the German position is, I, I know the, the British is, uh, um, there is no rule in a, in a state of emergency, but the German position was uh, uh, Article 125 uh, excludes bailouts. Uh, even if it does, we did help Greece, and at the same time it was uh, clear that this uh, was combined with uh, uh, a kind of conditional help for Greece. Yes. I, see, I say this is the German position yes. at least. Yes. Um, and I, I see the position that you can say the, uh, the, the, the Greek, uh, Greek government was not able any longer to, um, uh, to, um, to judge about its own, uh, its own uh, budget. At the same time, the German position is, uh, there are con if you want our help, uh, these are the conditions. And you know uh, that Wolfgang Schäuble in 2015, this would have been the alternative, would have been to leave the yes. euro. Yes. And this is what Wolfgang Schäuble in 2015 wanted. I think um, it would have been better uh, if uh, Greece would have left the euro, not uh, if this would have be done in a fair way and not as uh, kicking out uh, the Greeks from the euro. Yeah, very interesting. It's, it's, just, it's, it's just striking that on this in this particular respect, the British sort of conventional yeah. wisdom is in favour of more integration yeah. than the German conventional wisdom, actually, even though obviously the Brits want to have nothing to do with it, but nevertheless. Yeah, I, just yes. One if anybody I wants to pursue audience. this, read Mervyn King's book, uh, The End of Alchemy where essentially he looks at what, what currency is. Because you know, we, we talk about these things, it's not about a set of rules. What, and, and he goes back to the history of you know, the Bank of England, 1684, and the sovereign strike deal. The sovereign says, I, I am the ultimate underwriter of your currency. And, and, and the merchants in the Bank of England say, and we provide you the liquidity. And his argument is that a currency requires a sovereign to underwrite. And then you've got the demands of international trade and democracy. And there will come a point Greece, you can do like student loans in England, where you can say, well, we hadn't really written it off, but you know, by the time you reach 50 and you haven't repaid it, you know, we forget about it, it's okay. Uh, Italy, I'm afraid you can't yeah. do this anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Then yeah. you will have to face up to yeah. who is the sovereign in this currency. And Germany doesn't want to be the sovereign, which I fully understand, but if, if Germany isn't gonna do it, who is he gonna be? And that requires a deep integration. I yeah, I, I, perfectly, I perfectly agree that this is the problem. Uh, what we are facing with the euro is kind of muddled through. I think if uh, we were back to 1988, um, we, wouldn't, um, uh, we wouldn't start the, euro, the, the monetary union again. However, now it's there, and 
I, I, see, uh, I see your point with this, uh, the kind of, uh, a kind of limbo we are in between uh, the, the German idea what, uh, of what Germany has agreed uh, and what others, as you say, what, what is necessary. At the moment, uh, it, uh, this, um, this um, kind of limbo um, goes on. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm completely aware of what you say. Might, this crisis might emerge, and this might be the crucial point where uh, the European uh, Union has to decide whether to continue uh, the monetary union or not. Yeah. Uh, and I see that economic experts say what you said, that it has to embark on a transfer union, but I would not exclude that there might be a political uh, decision to say it doesn't work, yeah. uh, and we make it the other way around. Very interesting. We must take questions and comments. Um, so let's um, start at the back there. And please say your name and affiliation. Uh, John Osmond, I'm a member of Chatham House uh, and a Europhile, disappointed Europhile. Um, we've talked about a number of things. I think many of them will be uh, not recognised by much of the population who have a, a simpler view about democratic accountability. Um, uh, you always get these phrases about unelected bureaucrats and so on. So just to give an example, which I regret, um, we had the referendum. It was preceded by a negotiation. The referendum was to leave. The result was to leave. Uh, throughout Europe, as far as I could see, that was um, stated as being a lose-lose situation. It was a failure. Now, on the UK side, you could see accountability. I mean, Cameron went, Osborne went, Clegg went. Um, Corbyn had to be go through re-election. You, you can see how failure leads to accountability in a democratic state. I didn't detect any accountability in Europe. I didn't see where the buck stopped for this fa their admitted failure. And I've, and I've got nothing against any individual, like Mr. Juncker or whoever, but surely it would have impressed not people in, people in this country, but people throughout Europe. There is some accountability if someone had accepted the buck stop with them. Great, thank you. The gentleman at the front. Um, <coughs> my name is John Preston. I've been variously uh, chairman a microphone. of the European Society of Oh, <laughs> start again. My name is John Preston. I've been variously chairman of the European Society at what was then the Oxford College of Technology, and then much later on London South Bank, and um, I've enjoyed that sort of European work. I want the panel to let me know how compatible sovereignty is with democracy, because history shows that countries that are very proud of their sovereignty break away from international institutions because they say it impinges on their sovereignty and they then go on, as in pre-war Germany and Japan, to make war. And we're not entirely sure if you could rightly call it the United Kingdom. I think it's mainly England at war with itself, trying to get somewhere that's equal a bit of a muddle. So sovereignty and democracy, how compatible are they? And how should countries organize themselves and therefore the European Union? Thank you. There was another one here somewhere. Yes, the gentleman at the front. Uh, my name is Byron Fry, uh, member of the uh, Chatham House and uh, IDA Ireland at the Irish uh, um, Inward Investment Agency. Uh, Dr. Ritter, I was hoping if you could elaborate a bit on the uh, um, integration of uh, defence forces. And I suppose being coming from a uh, neutral country, the uh, necessity for doing that relative to doing that through an organization such as NATO instead. Were there any other questions? Should I go back to the panel? I guess I'll do that. Um, Gisela, do you want to start? So we've got accountability, um, sovereignty, and um, I guess the EU versus NATO on defense. Yeah. And I guess the accountability question in particular comes back to what we talked about in terms of um, that this, this way in which you sort of have a permanent grand coalition in the European, um, in, as the sort of European government, as it were. Um, and so the, back to Gisela's point about sort of, you want to be able to vote out government, you want to be able to change policies as well, but you want to be able to kick the bums out, right? 
Gisela. Yeah, I, you see, I, I really, to, to, to properly answer that question, you, you need to go back to the fundamentals which, which led to where we are today, and that is post-World War II settlement was to come as a structure which deals with the, the dark underbelly of nationalism uh, and ideologies and what that leads to, and you've got to stop, want to stop Germany and France ever going to war again. And, and part of that structure was you, you required economic stability. Uh, and you were trying to create the sort of kind of wisdom structure, you know, the guardians of the treaties, who in exchange for not exciting you too much about ideology and, 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 and elections and all these kind of things, would pro provide you a better tomorrow. The, 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 the economically better tomorrow was the driving force for taking out the excitement of ideological battles. Uh, because there was this assumption, a very European assumption, that there is such a thing as a right answer, which you don't contest. You, you find it. It's a very Jesuitical concept that as long as you sit in the horseshoe and talk about it long enough, you find it. Whereas the Brits sort of say, well, let's see what is the most appropriate answer at this stage. Uh, you go yay or nay, or as, well, you argue for three years and arrive, don't arrive at a conclusion. But, and that takes the defense one, part of that deal, which is very often forgotten, is that the original common market's economic stability and the better tomorrow <coughs> was intrinsically linked with that the security was provided for by NATO. The, 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 the defense element and the economic element actually <coughs> went hand in hand. And on the, the, the defense one, I know it's not just you know, the Irish. I think the Austrians have got great problems. The Finns have got great problems. They kind of say, if you want, if you want a mutual defense clause in, in, in the Euro European level, we join NATO. And I think we, we need to go back to, uh, if, if the system of the bureaucratic not, not punishing failure, uh, other than, the, you know, they do, they do, the commissions tend to get removed. But what I would introduce is that an out, you know, if, if you wanted to make it more, more, more accountable, I would say an outgoing commission, any proposals which in the life of one commission haven't come to fruition is gone. I mean, at the moment, all you can remove any ideas is negotiate them to death. Because, you know, the patent, I remember the patent directive. I mean, how long has that been going on for? By the time you finally agree, it's not worth having anymore. Um, so, so there are bits where rather than uh, punishing failure, because I think that system is a bit too far, you could have stops and saying, and this is the new commission which comes in and the new council set up and a and, and new parliament and you will be able to show what you have produced and what you haven't produced, and that gives us some. But, uh, but on the defense, I tell you, I think the real biggest problem is that it's the displacement activity of that we argue about political accountability when what we're losing all across Europe is the most basic capability. I mean, the Germans and the Dutch are doing some very interesting stuff together, which is totally outside the European Union framework. The, what Britain and France has done under the St. Malo Agreement, completely outside the, the EU stuff. So, so my hunch is that the real developments on, on defense are happening, and they're happening on an intergovernmental level. And to, to argue over the EU uh, dimension, I think, is a distraction. Andreas? Mm -hmm. um, as regards the question of uh, accountability, um, I think um, what you expected from a European Commission uh, which can uh, be held accountable for uh, the promises uh, during a, an electoral campaign, I think, th I think it's a kind of illusion about uh, the European Union, since uh, we have completely different electoral campaigns since we don't have uh, a common European public. Uh, what is debated uh, during the electoral campaign for the European Parliament in Poland is completely different from what is uh, uh, discussed uh, in Spain. And I would say this is not what I would expect from, from the European Union. I'm uh, content with less. Um, uh, on the uh, on the European level, it's it's not for me, uh, the, the Ursula von der Leyen is for me is not the head of a government uh, of uh, United States of uh, Europe. I I would uh, expect. So um, in so far as long as there is no nothing like a European public, um, I think we won't have that. And as I said, I wouldn't expect it. Um, so the second question, how compatible is sovereignty and democracy? In, uh, so uh, at least from a German constitutional uh, viewpoint, sovereignty has uh, two aspects. The one is uh, uh, the sovereignty of the people and the other is the uh, sovereignty of a state. I think you, you meant more meant the question uh, of the sovereignty of a state and how far this is. 
uh, compatible with, with democracy. So I would say, um, different from the British taking back control, uh, on the continent, and particularly in Germany, there is much more sympathy for this idea of shared sovereignty. And what I would say that this idea of shared sovereignty, um, which has become part uh, of this um, uh, specific construction of the European Union, um, is historically new. Uh, so I think this is really a new phenomenon which has emerged, say, with the European uh, community after 1950 and even more with European Union uh, after Maastricht. Uh, I would say this is a historically specific and, and, and new development. Um, and to, uh, as regards uh, the question of defense, I, I completely agree um, what you said about NATO. The, 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 the problem is um, that uh, the reliability of NATO is deteriorating. I think we need to face that as Europeans. Um, I think um, we, uh, we, can't, we, we shouldn't abandon NATO, of course, but uh, Europeans uh, need to stand uh, for themselves. So I think this new defense initiative uh, resting on a kind of voluntary uh, contribution uh, is a, a right way of doing it. But I wholeheartedly uh, um, support what you said, uh, that in the end, uh, European, a really European defense politics uh, 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 rests on cooperation of governments uh, and of nation states. And this is what, what I say, uh, we, uh, th th there is no alternative between, uh, it's not an alternative uh, between the uh, EU and Brussels on the one hand, uh, or, or the nation states and their cooperation on the other hand. I think a strong European Union would uh, realize that Europe as a whole only can be strong if its nation states are strong. Uh, and so, as I would say, uh, look to the, uh, to the Elysee Treaty between Germany and France. Uh, it's besides uh, the European uh, integration, European institution, uh, but uh, uh, it's uh, no damage to the European uh, institutions. Um, so I would say a strong European Union does not have a problem with really nation state cooperation uh, and uh, does not have to fear it. So, I would know there is no neither, uh, uh, no, uh, not one or the other, but the, 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 the prudent combination of nation state cooperation and supranational integration, uh, as you asked before. I think a prudent, um, a, a prudent combination which does not fear that nation state cooperation would weaken the European Union. This, I think, is the wrong alternative, uh, and a prudent European Union, a uh, prudent Europe uh, would stand both. How much of this discussion do you think has to do with different conceptions of democracy? Because, and in particular, different conceptions in different EU member states. Because you know, Gisela was talking about um, the sort of Jesuitical approach on the one hand, versus I suppose a, a, an Anglo-American approach, which is about sort of fighting things out. Um, um, you know, and the referendum sort of demonstrates this. Um, and the EU, it seems to me, embodies a sort of a much more consensual notion, as, as Gisela was indicating, which fits much more neatly, it seems to me, with how German democracy works. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not right sure whether this is a question of concepts or democra of democracy or whether it's more a question of geopolitics uh, and of historical experience. Uh, you know, if you say this consensu uh, consensual uh, model, if you ask for uh, pre-war pre Germany, so uh, um, uh, the German experience uh, in never to be isolated in Europe uh, and never uh, to stand against the other European and uh, European and never to wage war is so deeply seated within the German DNA after 1945 uh, that I sometimes think um, that it's rather this question of historical experience, yes. uh, historical lessons Germans think to have learned uh, than, uh, than a question of uh, concepts of democracy. Yes, but, but it's clearly rooted in history. But as a German who knows Britain quite well and yeah. spent some time here, do you, do you not, I mean, you made this point about um, shared sovereignty. You know, yeah. this, this is something which I think it goes back to the, the question, um, this is something which Brits struggle with, I think, partly because of yeah. the way that we have a very unitary political system where sovereignty, we have quite a simple conception of sovereignty. Um, there's a bit of a tension between, you know, are the people sovereign or is parliament sovereign? Yeah, yeah. And that's playing out right now, obviously, but it's relatively simple compared to this idea of a sort of multi-level governance, which I think in Germany you're much more comfortable with. 
yeah, on the one hand, much more comfortable with. What is interesting, if you talked to a German constitutional expert about the term of uh, sovereignty, uh, it would just be the question of is the sovereignty with the people or with anybody else, and not the question of sovereignty of a state in international relations. So uh, 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 German constitutional experts are, are deeply focused on this question of constitutional uh, sovereignty and not sovereignty in terms uh, of uh, international state politics. Sovereignty, yeah, yes. State sovereignty, yes. Yeah. Gisela, you wanted to jump About in? About 12 years ago, there was an article in, in the uh, Prospect, and it was on, on the Japanese uh, author's byline. And, as, and it was the most perceptive analysis of the difference between the Brits and the Germans. I, I then subsequently uh, discovered it was written by a British diplomat who couldn't put his name to it. Uh, and essentially what he said, seafaring nations know that, that you can never control the waves. The best you can do is ride them. Mm. So you end up with structures which allow you to respond to unexpected circumstances mm. in the most appropriate way at any given time. And he said, and that's the Brits. The Germans, they have their forests, they have their rules, they have their roots, they require the framework. And this is always, this is always, I find, the really big difference that, you know, the, the Germans will happily say, but this is how the single currency rules are. Open brackets, unless Germany and France breaks them, then we'll change the rules. But then we've got the rules again. So there's, I think there's a different approach to rules that, if for, for the Germans, it's, it's what defines the parameters which shapes you, it's a bit like you know, buildings shaping you, whereas for the Brits, they are kind of how you get through today, tomorrow, yeah. and the day after. <laughs> Just, yeah, yeah. That, uh, perfect, perfectly true, and I would like to add one certain historical experience. Um, since I think uh, particularly constitutional history uh, uh, in Germany is deeply aware that there has been one uh, crucial sin in, in German history, um, uh, you know, when the famous German constitutional expert Karl Schmidt wrote uh, in, in July 1934, uh, when Hitler had killed his entourage uh, from, the, from the SA, uh, Karl Schmidt wrote uh, a famous article uh, with the headline, uh, Der Führer schützt das Recht, uh, the, Führer, the Führer protects the law. Uh, and this is what German constitutional experts know, uh, what must never happen again. And so this stripped the Germans off this yes. pragmatism and the, 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 the lesson Germans learned out of that, that this must never happen again. And this means for German, from a German perspective, um, that rules particularly must work in a state of emergency. And this explains much of the German behavior in the Euro crisis. Yeah, and that's the exact quote that I remember from that conference. And at the date of overwrite, and then of course Peter Hennessy, the great constitutional expert, who, is, you know, who deserves a sainthood in my book, he said that this week in the United Kingdom, we had a principle which was called the good chap theory, which meant that some rules, you, good chaps knew, you never questioned and you never broke. And he said this week we're seeing the end of the good chap theory. So uh, the process of, of the UK leaving the European Union may curiously either make us more European yes. in the way we operate yes. or yes. more American, but yes. yet to be seen. That's a great place to, yeah. to end. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you so much to both of our heroic um, panellists, um, Gisela for stepping in at the last minute, Andreas for coming to London even though you have a, a cold. Um, so thank you very, very much. Um, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>